Hi, good evening everybody and welcome to the daily shear in Rambam, three chapters per day. One of the greatest halachic authorities of all time, known as the Taz, his name was Rabdovid Segal, and he was a student by the Bach, which was the Goen Rabiel Sirkish. And every time he was visiting the Bach, the Bach had a daughter, and he, once upon a time, while the Taz was attending there, he turns to his daughter and asking her, how come when always I am here alone with you, you are always serious and you never sm smile. However, when this boy, this gentleman is here, you are really always happy, pleasant, and you are shining like the moon. Shines to be the Levono. And she have answered him, Well, there is a Maimir Chazal. Our sages are saying, Mishenichnas Av. When the father is here, Av means the month of Av, and Av means the father. Memating Besimcho, I'm reducing happiness. But Mishenichnas Ot Del sounds like Oder. Ot Del, this individual. Marbim Besimcho. Her father liked very much her respond, and he turned to his students and he asks him, Vos Oxtu, what do you say? And says, Since you mentioned that she is shining like Dilevono, it's about time to be Mekadesh Dilevono. And Take indeed, he married her, and he is known as one of the greatest illuminators of the Torah and the world of Halokha of all times on the Shulchan Aruch. The reason that I'm starting this uh, story, since today's subject will be divided to the happiest day of the year, which is the day of Purim, and the saddest day of the year. The saddest day of the year is the day of Tisha B'Av. And both of those days being covered by the Rambam of today. And since always, we starting with the tough part and later on we moving to the happier one. The Rambam as well, his first chapter of the day out of those three chapters covers the days of fasting that are being honored and respected by the entire Jewish community. Yesterday, we were zooming in on different crisis events that are taking place locally, whether by a certain individual or by a community locally. Today, the topic is those fests that are part of our history and the importance for us to remember and to observe and practice those customs that are associated with those days are a double. First of all, to remember that our negative deeds and the deeds of our forefathers, of our parents, which got us into trouble, the only way to come out of this situation is to remember those events, realize a certain cause brought those crisis and disaster upon us and the only way to come out of it is by improving our ways and by bringing the redemption. So it's very interestingly it is noticing, you can notice a trend of number five. First of all there is five total collective fests that are being observed by the entire community. Those five Four of them are mentioned in the Tanakh and one of them became a custom which have ad were adopted later. The first one is the one that will be observed in about a week from today at the 17th day of Tammuz. The second one is Tishabov. The third one 
is Soim Gedalio, the fourth one is Asor Beteves, and the fifth one is Tiny Sestem. He starts with the first one, the 17th day of Tammuz is being instituted for five reasons. And it's interesting to note that those reasons are ranging as far as time line goes from the biblical era, which means from the time that we became a nation, the first time of becoming a nation. So when Moshe Rabbeinu broke the Luchos, he came down after 40 days since the receiving of the Torah and he found the entire Jewish people participating in the greatest sin of all times, the golden calf. So he went ahead and broke the Luchos. That was the first event. The same day, many years later, the Korban Atomid, the daily offering, have stopped in Bais Rishon. Then the second temple, the entire wall of Jerusalem, were basically were broken by the enemies. Years later, the Roman when the Roman took control over Jerusalem, they went ahead and they burned the Torah and they placed a Tselem, a idol worship in the Heichal, in the Holy Chamber. So again, five reasons that on Shiva also the Tammuz, the 17th day of Tammuz, are being marked as a day of sorrow, the day of fest. However, and again, this is not the toughest fest. The real toughest fest is the fest of Tisha B'Av, of the ninth day of Av. And again, the ninth day of Av was established for five reasons as well. And also ranging on the timeline from the first year when the Jews were in the desert, they have sent the spies to look, to search and see how strategically they will be able to take over Israel. They came with bad news and they badmouthed the city and they really oppressed any, to say the least, any desire and any drive for them to go. And God Almighty promised this night you have cried a cry for no reason. However, in the future, I will give you many reasons for you to cry. So indeed, the first temple was destroyed in this day. The second temple was destroyed in this day. Later, it was been even an uprising attempt by the Jews led by a great general named as Bar Kokhva, who really boosted the national confidence and really managed to bring hope. And yet, unfortunately, it finished with a great disappointment where not only they came in, they took over, they murdered, they stabbed, they had also the cruelty not to let for many years to bury, and basically the blood of the victims have been pouring and streaming as rivers in the city of Betar for quite a prolonged time. And at the same time, years later, also foreign entity they went and plowed the entire area where the temple was standing on and that was the final fulfillment of the harsh prophecy of Tzioin Soda Tehoresh, that Tzioin Zion, the place where the base Hamikdosh were there, will be plowed like, uh, like a field. Some of the other fests, they also associated with stages in the exile of the Jewish people and loss of their sovereignty and the loss of our uh, temple and Beis Amikdosh, yet they are not as famous and sometimes not as long because they happen to follow so in the season of the year where the day is shorter and I'm ref referring to the same Gedalio which was a assassination in the time period post the first temple destruction where one Jewish leader 
who was managing the local affairs and yet internal politics took in and a uh, rivalry led to one of his political rivals to go and stab him and Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian government saw it as an uprising act of rebellion against their government and the little survivors who were managing their affairs in Jerusalem at that time, they also disappeared. So it basically put the final nail in the coffin of uh, exile and sufferings in those times. Then there is the Asso Betavis, the 10 day of the Tevis, when the first blockade over Jerusalem was initiated by Nebuchadnezzar. And the fifth and final one, though it is not mentioned in the Bible, although it is hinted in uh, Megillah's Esther, and this is associated with, again, marking a event which took place in history while the Jewish people were defending themselves in the empire of Achashverosh in the day of Purim. So by the requirement of Anocho, any time a, a war takes place, so the participating parties of the war, they have to fast. However, since the actual soldiers who are in the battlefield, they cannot fast, because if they would fast, they won't be able to function on the battlefield. So anybody who is in the area have to fast. And since Esther was the only one in the area who were capable to fast, so for that reason, this particular fast is named after her, Ta'anit Estel. Now, as I've mentioned before, the most severe tiniest of them all is Tisha B'Av. and it is severe in a few reasons. First of all, the day of the fast starts not from the morning, but starts in the eve of Tisha B'Av, right before sunset. Then the restriction of eating flesh, eating meat, and drinking wine, and wearing new clothes is starting in some communities the week that Tisha B'Av falls in it, or sometimes, according to some communities, it starts even on Rosh Chodesh. It is important to note that, and that reminds me a very interesting story that once upon a time, you can see it on the dollars while the Rebbe distributing dollars to the crowd. Some of the people passing by, he introduces himself and he says, well, I am the member of the Hevra Kadisha. He said it with such excitement and the Rebbe looks at him and he says, well, the only thing I can wish you, you should basically unemployed with not much activity goes on. So the idea of a fast in general, as we have mentioned, is not, all, not to nail the fast as a permanent item, because after all, the idea of a fast is in order to bring us to contemplate upon the reason who brought us into this trouble, in order that God will come and take away the situation, inspire us to do the right thing, in order for him to remove the consequences of the trouble that we are finding ourselves in. So, therefore, since Tisha B'Av was the core of all trouble, as we said also in the timeline, it dates back to the night where Kol Ho'ido, where the entire community, they cried and they expressed their will to stay in the desert. So, as I've mentioned, not only that <coughs> it is being practiced some restriction of mourning before Tisha B'Av, on Tisha B'Av, 
and on top of it there is five additional restrictions besides eating drinking having intimate relation bathing or even using any lotion for the purpose of pleasure furthermore even the study of torah as well it is restricted on tishabov one of the reasons because this the study of torah is considered to be a very happy activity the only part in torah which is permitted to learn on tisha b'av will be pertaining only to the stories associated with the destruction of the temple and the events led to it generally we marking the destruction not only on tisha b'av since right now we are in a state of destruction so part of the custom that are associated is for example some special crowns that used to be wear by grooms and bride on the day of the weddings previously so those crowns are not being worn anymore as a act of sympathy of practicing mourning for the destruction another custom when a person starts to construct his house he should not construct it in the style that uh, kings or ministers are aristocracy and if he does he should make sure that at least amo al amo at least half a meter by half a meter should be not uh, painted not complete there is another uh, custom it's not a custom it's a rule when a person gets to Yerushalayim and he sees the temple so he must to practice Kriya to rip his clothes and uh, interesting uh, note depends from which direction he comes if he comes from the direction that first he gets into Yerushalayim and then to Beis Amikdosh so he perf performs two separate Kriya one first time he is touring his garments for Yerushalayim and the second one on the base of Mikdosh however if he goes he comes to Yerushalayim from the different direction he bumps into the temple first and then comes to Yerushalayim so he makes only one Kriyo on the temple but continues the same Kriyo to make it longer when he gets to Yerushalayim. The conclusion of the Rambam of Hilchois Tainios is with the following statement that in the future the days of the fest of the public fests those five fests will be annulled not only they will be annulled but they will be turning to days of festivity and happiness and the Rebbe explained two explanation why the Rambam is concluding these rules with this Maimir Chazal and the Rebbe explains that since the idea of a fest is the idea of tshuva return return can be done out of fear and return can be done out of love when tshuva is being done out of love not only god almighty forgives and erase the sin but also the sin is turning to be a mitzvah the doinois, even the liberate sin, are turning to be the chuyois. And for that reason, since the ultimate purpose of those fests is in order to inspire us collectively to go through a mode of tshuva, so the Rambam is implying that those tshuva will be so effective that even the days that currently being practiced with Avelus, they will be turning to be days of festivity. Then there is another explanation why it is very necessary from a halachic standpoint 
of the Rambam to quote that the future, in the future, those days will be turning to days of happiness. Since there is another principle that the Torah will never going to be changed. And therefore, when in the future, the, these days will be turning to holiday, a person may ask himself, hey, how come it can be turned to a holiday if we know that So the answer is, the only thing that is not going to be changed, if something that to begin with, it was introduced as a permanent reality. But any halocho that originally was introduced, that it will be relevant and will be active only on a permanent basis. So when the expiry date appears, you're not really violating or contradicting pre-existing principles of the nitzchius of the permanent permanence of Toyo. I would like to conclude as a closing remarks for the Hilcho Steinis. There is one of the greatest masters of Hasidus. He said, if he would have only the power in his hand, he would annul and he would cancel all the Ta'aniyos. The only two Ta'aniyos, only two fests he cannot cancel will be in Kippur and Tisha B'Av. And the reason is because there is no need to cancel. On Yom Kippur, who is needs to eat? If a person is in Yom Kippur in a state of a maloch, since when a maloch needs to eat? So cancellation or not cancellation is irrelevant. It's not going to do anything. And on Tisha B'Av, who is capable to eat? When a person is in a such a state of sadness, a state of sadness, how can he even capable to it? So even the cancellation is not needed because when a person is experiencing such a grave, uh, grieving on the loss of the greatest, most precious things in his uh, life, obviously he is not able to it. There is a story about one of the rabbis who lived in Chicago, Rabbi Aaron Soloveitchik, Hagoen Aaron Soloveitchik, which I remember him when he was participating in the first Siyum Rambam. They were making a Siyum Rambam on Ilkhoi Steinis and Ilkhoi Zmanim, and he said that the Rambam was such a part of his upbringing in the home of the Brisk dynasty. And he said before he was capable to say Abba, and before he was capable even to say Ima, he said, the Rambam Mishver. So this rabbi, when he came to visit the Rebbe on the Nichum Avelim, after the Stalkus of the Rebetzin, he shared with the Rebbe a very Gishmak about that Chazal are saying, Kol Hamis Abel Al Yerushalayim, anybody who is mourning over Jerusalem, so the word Zoyche in Hebrew means in present tense. And the question is, how come it is not written Yiske, he will merit to see in its Binyono, in its reconstruction. It says Zoyche that he is currently Zoyche. And the answer is, typically any loss a person experience, any personal mourning. So Chazal are saying, Gzeiro al Hames, there is a destiny upon a dead person, Sheishtakach min halev, throughout 12 months. It is a destiny, any person who dies within 12 months, his memory or the, of course, his memory of loss and pain going to be erased Min Hazikorin from the memory of the people who were precious, who were close to him. So at the moment that after so many thousands of years, we are still mourning the loss of Yerushalayim, the destruction of the Beis Amikdosh, this itself is a proof that in our mind and in our heart is not dead. And the capability to revive Yerushalayim into our heart and into our minds something that is alive, this itself 
is zoiche bischus veloi ebe binyano that he is able to see in uh, in the binyan of Yerushalayim. In the second uh, chapter of the daily Rambam of today, the Rambam, as we said before, the second part of the Rambam, deals with the Purim and everything related to Purim. So the first chapter of Hilchis Purim deals with the institution of reading the Megillah. Who is obligated to read the Megillah? And basically everybody, men, women, even children, though they themselves not obligated, however, their parents are committed as part of the Chinuch of education to have them participate in Kriyasa Megillah. The only thing that can be postponed, that Megillah will be postponed because of, is if a person meets a mess mitzvah, a person who dies and cannot be buried unless he will take care of it. So this is the only thing that is capable to postpone the obligation of the Megillah. The idea of reading the Megillah takes place at the night and by the day. There is, given the fact that it says, Lekayim yemeyapurim bizmanehem, in the Megillah there is a verse that it was given to fulfill the obligation of Megillah bizmanehem in their times, plurally. So our sages derived Zmanim hal benit nolohem. There is many times where the Megillah uh, can be read. For example, when there is an independent sovereignty in a kingdom of Jews, so those residents who reside in villages, given the fact that it is hard for them to gather uh, in the day of Purim in their villages, so they were given the opportunity to read before Purim, before our Purim, starting from the day of 11th of Adal. However, and um, important to note that today this ruling doesn't exist since we don't have our own sovereignty and excessive involvement with over the times that were designated by Chazal about the Megillah can lead to uh, anti-Semitism, to animosity and to antagonization. So for that reason, uh, it is not being practiced anymore, the extra days for Bnei HaKfolim. Shabbos, if uh, Purim falls on Shabbos, Megillah is not read for the same reason as Shofar is not being blown, which is called Gzeiro de Rabbe, a rabbinical decree that is suspecting that the people who are not expert in ability to read the Megillah or blow the Shofar while they will be heading to their master to practice some aspects of blowing or reading, they may forget or being distracted from the um, Shabbos limitation of not carrying Birshus or not moving from one domain to another. It is important to note that over the years, the Rebbe have devoted an unprecedented amount of hours. And fortunately, thank God, that most of those Fabrengans left in audio recording, some of them are even in video, uh, where the Rebbe really covered the aspects of Purim, both halachically, uh, mystically, philosophically, and with the relevance for us today. And there is, even on the halacha that we said before, sure, I mean, there is an endless amount there's an endless ocean of gems, but regarding what we said before, that even if a person has a custom to learn Torah constantly, he needs to be mevatel his Torah in order to read the Megillah. And the Rebbe was asking, why was the Rambam writes mevatel in Torah to read the Megillah? Isn't the Megillah itself his Torah? And the Rebbe answered, it's true, 
that Megillah is Torah. However, it comes to teach us another halacha. If a person is capable to learn Torah in a very thorough way, in a very deep manner, and instead he is taking the approach of easy reading, this itself can be defined as a bitul toyon. In other words, a person should always stretch his limits to the maximum in order to always utilize his potential to the maximum. And if he's not doing it, although it may be a very positive thing, it is still considered a bitul toyon. In the In regarding to the Megillah in general, Hazal are telling us that Esther's request by the Chachomim was Kisvuni Ledoyois, Kvouni Ledoyois. You should write the Neis, the miracle of, of Purim, and make it to be a part of the Jewish practice in the same level of severity as biblical commandments are being observed. And Chachomim, the sages in her time, were very hesitant. And the reason why they were hesitant, they said, Kino at metilo oleinu. This glorifying and overstating the miracle of Purim may lead to a new wave of anti-Semitism, antagonism, and hate by the nations of the world towards Jews. And Chazal are saying that for this hesitation by the sages, she is responded with one of the final verses in the Megillah system. And the final verse in Megillah Sestel is a verse that states, Haloiheimo ksuvim al sefer divrei hayomim lemalchei modai uporas. So the obvious question, how those verses can be used as a rebuttal for the argument of the Chachomim. And the Rebbe explains something very profound that basically Haman is the poster child of anti-Semitism and anti-Semites of all the nations. And the story goes about him that he came to Ahasuerus and in order to justify his hatred toward the Jews, he used to the term Shei Pei. Shei Pei is abbreviation of two words. Shabbos Hayoim, Pesach Hayoim. He says, Jews are a very big hindrance for the economy. Every day they have another holiday. Today is Shabbos, tomorrow is Pesach. Further than this, he said to Ahasuerus, take a look at this Mordechai. Mordechai, being an observant Jew, so if you will give him a wine and he won't drink it because part of their decrees is stam yenum. however if a fly will fall into his wine he will remove the fly and he will drink the wine so obviously this nation is not a nation that is on your side and this was the reason that the words of Haman of the anti-Semites have appealed to Ahasuerus. And he made a decree. And the question is, Esther Hamalko did not deny all the arguments that Haman Horosho have stated. He accepts it. However, what have changed the mind of Ahasuerus to cancel the decree of Haman? What really have changed change the fact that despite the religious differences, despite all the arguments, he knew that the only one who he can trust in the time of crisis, the only time 
who was actually on his side and was able to save him from death by his own guards was only Mordechai Tzadik. And for that reason, she said to the Chachomim, Haloyheim, all the events, all the argument, all the slogans, all the campaigns are quite familiar to him and they are written and recorded in the books of Malchai Poa Sumada. You're not going to add anything. So if they looking for reasons to hate us, they will find the reasons. However, if we are going to instill in our heart and in our mind the recognition that God Almighty is the only one who is in control, only that way we will be able to continue the heritage and tradition forever on a permanent uh, way. As the opening to the third chapter of today, I would like to bring the words of the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov is explaining the first halokhe of the final chapter of the Rambam today. It says, if a person if a person reads the Megillah, he reads it entirely, but not according to the order it is written. For example, a person comes into a shul, he sees the crowd is holding in the second half of the Megillah. So he says, well, I'm going to read right now with them. And then he moves into another room and he decides now I will read the first part of the Megillah. So he was not fulfilling the mitzvah. Reason? Because he was not reading according to the order that the Megillah is written. So the Baal Shem Tov is interpreting this statement in the following manner. He says, a a person, he reads the Megillah and he views whatever it is written lemafreya, retroactively. That whatever it was written in the Megillah is only relevant to something, to the history, to the condition, to the environment that was then, 2,000 years ago. If a person limits the relevance of the Megillah to the past, so he did not fulfill the Megillah because the entire story of the Megillah is the story that must be relevant, must be applicable to us here and today. So there is on the other hand, if a person reads the Megillah according to the order, though it was quite an interruption or a recess between one passage on the other, as long as he did it in order, he fulfilled the mitzvah. There is quite a important discussion being made about the shape, the material of the parchment, the ink that the Megillah is written on, the line, the straight line, which is called Sirtut, which must be underneath the text of the Megillah. There is another need to express while the person reads the name, the names, the 10 names of the sons of Haman in one breath in order to display that they all killed at once. And the final remarks that the Rambam concludes the rules of Purim, the rules of Kriyasa Megillah, is the following sentence. He says that in the future, all the Moyadim, all the holidays, they are tent lehibotel, to be annulled, to be cancelled. Besides the day of Purim, that will be engraved permanently in the practice and in the collective memory. And the question is obviously, what does it mean? The other holidays are going to be canceled? And one of the popular answers, they're not going to be canceled. However, the vibration, the energies, the godly revelations that will be then will be so great that the excitement of the other holidays are not going to be as great as the excitement of Purim. That this excitement will always going to remain. There is another explanation that are given by the Rebbe in um, connection to the fact that the Torah, since it was given by not really letting the Jews have a full freedom of choice, as Chazal are explaining, 
And all the Jewish people were standing underneath the mountain. And the interpreting uh, that why is it written underneath the mountain that God Almighty told him, if you're accepting the Torah, it's fine. And if not, you're going to be buried under the mountain. So Mikan, from that sentence, So it's an excuse for Jews to say when they are not really following the path of Torah, well, your expectation from us is not really justifiable since the Torah was not really chosen by us, it was real, it was forced upon us. However, on the days of Purim, it says, Kimu vekiblu ayuhudim. The Jews had a renewed acceptance of the Torah with their pure will. So they gave a retroactive certification and acceptance and validity to the Torah. Since they gave it on their free, pure choice and will of heart, therefore it has such a great per permanency that although other holidays going to be moved and canceled, the days of Purim will always going to be remaining. So today we have almost finished the entire book. Tomorrow we will be concluding the book of Zmanim, the third book of the Rambam's great work. And we will be starting tomorrow the first, the first, uh, the first book of Seder Noshim. It's a new book. So tomorrow we'll, in fact, we'll have the final seum and a beginning of a new book. Thank you very much.